Welcome everyone to our Sunday worship for the 6th of September. If you're a Methodist watching this and you understand the way that the connection works, Happy New Year. If you are a native of Swaziland, Happy Independence Day. Let us pray. His name is Almighty and he is Lord. His name is Creator and he makes all things new. His name is Sustainer, and he holds us in the palm of his hand. His name is the Saviour, and he died in our place. His name is Forgiveness, and he can be trusted to heal and to bless. His name is Holy, and he is the one we have come to worship. His name means he is worthy to receive all we have and all we are for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing a song about gathering together. And I realise that in one sense we are not gathered, we are scattered in different places and almost certainly watching this at different times, maybe not even on the 6th of September. But in a very real sense, we are still united in Christ and he can bridge that gap of space and time and bring his people together. So we're going to sing, as we are gathered, Jesus is here. Let's continue with a prayer of praise. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you for your power which holds us and holds everything, for your grace which touches and renews us, for your love that gives us life and makes us whole, for your sovereign will that maps out our journey and then gives us the freedom to choose. Lord, we honour you for your holiness, which measures our lives, and for your mercy that lifts us up and whispers, you can begin again. Lord, we bow before you in love and adoration. There is no God like you, no God besides you. You are our God and we will have no other. You are our God and we will worship you with all we have and with all we are, now and forever. Amen. And let's join in 
the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I've invited um, our new colleague, Gabriella, who has joined us in the Sleaford Circuit this year, to read our uh, gospel lesson for us. This is the set gospel lesson for today. Hear the Gospel of Christ. We hear Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the Gospel of Christ. I want to focus our thoughts today on one particular verse in that passage. I'll touch on the context and the surrounding verses, but the verse I want to focus on is verse 19. Again, said Jesus, Truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. I want to explore what that's about. I want to say how I think sometimes we treat it too simplistically. And sometimes we overcomplicate things. And then I will reach the end of my sermon and stop. So three points. What's it mean? There does seem to be in this passage a link between earth and heaven. We pray in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want there to be that equality between the two. And in that same passage that Gabriella read for us, we get the concept that what we bind or loose on earth will be bound or loosed in heaven. That does seem quite a strange concept in some ways, as if what we do in one place can have its effect somewhere else. But actually, it is a concept that we ought to be used to for one very simple reason, most of us know how to use a telephone. And a telephone is a, a means of doing something in one place that has a, an impact somewhere else. If I phone you, I talk here at home, probably here in this very study, 
where I am now standing, but you're in your home. So what you're actually hearing is not me, not unless you live next door and I shout, otherwise you're too far away. You can't possibly hear me. What you hear is a little loudspeaker in the telephone that uh, vibrates and produces sound that sounds like me. And due to the wonders of the telephone system, it's synchronized in some way so that what I say here in one place is heard somewhere else. It's not actually me doing the talking in the other place. It's the loudspeaker, but it is so much in sync with what I'm saying that it seems to be me. And what you say in that place, I hear here. I hear here. You know what I mean, I hope. It's as if we are talking to each other and we don't think about uh, messages going down telephone wires and microphones and loudspeakers. When I phone you, I feel I'm talking to you. You feel as if you're talking to me. The connection is that close. Is that the kind of connection that Jesus is talking about between earth and heaven? Another example, and again, something we're very much used to, is if you drive a car. When you're driving a car, you're sitting in a, a, an enclosed space and you have three pedals to press and a gear stick and a wheel in front of you. And you manipulate those things in a certain way and the car moves, the tires grip the road, the car travels, the engine increases and decreases and the car moves places. And all you are doing as the driver is sitting, moving the wheel, pressing the buttons, shifting the gear stick. And yet you don't think of it like that. If you want to take a junction on the left, you don't think, right, I need to press this pedal and then that pedal and move this gear stick and turn this wheel in front of me by a certain amount. You just think, I'll turn left here, and you do. The, the connection between what you're doing inside the car and what's actually happening between the tires and the road and the engine is, is so close that we feel that we're driving the car. We, we don't analyze it any more than that. Is that something like what Jesus was talking about in this link between two of us on earth agreeing and our Father in heaven doing it? Is it something that has become so second nature that we don't even think about it. We're not thinking we've got to do this here on earth so that God will do this in heaven. But we are so much in tune with one another that it just becomes natural. We, we want God to work in a particular way and we come to him in prayer. And it happens. Is that the kind of experience that Jesus is driving at here? Well, if it is, I have to say, it's not one that we commonly experience. It would be wonderful if we did, if our rapport with heaven was so close that it came as naturally as talking to someone on the phone or driving a car. Uh, but the reality is it doesn't seem to be like that. This is where I think we oversimplify that statement. We think, if Jesus meant two of us agreeing, that ought to be a really easy thing to do. If we take it at face value, if I hear of someone who is ill and I think God ought to heal that person, all I have to do then is find someone else and say, I want God to heal this person. Do you agree with me? Can we agree to pray together about this? And the other person says, yes, I agree. God should heal that person. Great, that's two of us here on earth. We're agreeing and up there, God hears our prayer. He knows his own 
scripture, he says to himself, right, that's two of them, they agree, I better do what they say. Of course, it's not as simple as that. It doesn't work like that. If only it did, we'd be able to cure cancer. All it takes is two of us to agree that it's a good idea for God to cure cancer. We'd be able to put an end to wars again by two of us agreeing and putting it before God and he can sort it out. Prayer doesn't work like that in my experience and I'm sure not in yours. So maybe we've oversimplified it. Maybe this idea of two people agreeing is not just the same as, you know, what do you fancy, pizza or curry? I fancy pizza. Oh, so do I. Good, we agree. Maybe it's something a little more subtle than that. The agreement in a, a greater depth. The other day, I said to my wife as we were driving to the supermarket, it's a good job that we're not in some kind of um, SWAT team or secret agent team uh, that depended on good communication for the successful outcome of a mission, because if we were, we'd fail miserably. We, we are not very good at communicating. What led me to that comment was uh, not particularly important circumstances, but it had happened like this. We'd, we'd gone out uh, to on, on foot uh, to run an errand and my wife had to put into her bag uh, into her shopping bag four small carrier bags because we were planning on going to the supermarket and we were going on foot and four small bags was about what we could manage and they they fold up nice and small so she had four small bags but Plan things didn't go quite according to plan. We ended up coming back to the house before we went to the supermarket and we ended up getting in the car and deciding that we might as well take the car to the supermarket. So I said, I'll get the bigger bags. And I went and picked up two bigger bags. Normally I'd have taken three, maybe four, but I knew that my wife still had those smaller bags in her shopping bag, so two was enough. Meanwhile, she, knowing that I was picking up some of the bigger bags, decided to leave behind the smaller bags because they weren't needed anymore. We discovered this in the car when it was too late really to go back. Both of us thought we understood what the other one was doing. We got it wrong. There was a, a muddle and we ended up with only two big bags, which wasn't quite enough. And we had to buy a third one at the supermarket to fit all the shopping in. If we'd done something that really depended on good communication, it was lacking. Despite the fact that we've been married for almost 40 years, I ought to know the way she thinks. She ought to know the way I think, but we still get it wrong. It's only when people really agree that that level of communication uh, is, is possible. Think of the SWAT team or, or you know, the, the police as a team working together, they're going on some mission. Everyone involved needs to know exactly what they're doing, not we've got a broad idea of what we're, we're hoping to, out, um, what we're hoping the outcome will be here. They need to know exactly, they need to agree every detail and act as one. Is that the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about? Not just some superficial agreement that it would be nice if God did a particular thing or answered a particular prayer, but a real heart-to-heart -heart agreement between Christians who, who are as one in wanting to, to do God's work and understanding what that work is. And when two such people come together, maybe that is when God really does listen and do what is asked. But the more I think about this, the more I wonder if I'm overthinking it. I'm making it too complicated now. Because what I'm trying to do, if I'm honest, the, the, the simple idea that two people agreeing will make sure that our prayers get answered doesn't match my experience or reality as I perceive it. So I'm trying to understand that in a more complicated way, such that it would only be a very rare thing 
even an impossible thing for two people to agree so completely. And in doing that, I, I'm explaining away what Jesus said. So, oh yes, if two people do agree, God will do it, but it's not going to happen because we're human and we can't ever agree to that level. But if I'm arguing that, well, why did Jesus say it in the first place? Why did Jesus say to us, well, here's one way in which prayer can be answered, but it's so overwhelmingly unlikely that you'll ever achieve this that it probably won't happen in your lifetime. Why would he say that? Maybe I need to come back and think, well, let's not overthink it. Let's not overcomplicate it. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that we should agree with one another. He's saying that it's not just as individuals that we come to God in prayer. It's as two people together or a bigger group, three people, where two or three are gathered. There, said Jesus, am I. And the whole of the passage is really about fellowship within the church. It's about how to deal with things when that fellowship goes wrong, how you deal with um, someone who is your fellow disciple, who you haven't got on with for some reason, and you need to sort that out. One-to-one -one if possible, a few people if not, the, the bigger group if that proves unlikely. But the, the whole uh, ethos of this is reconciliation, fellowship, being in agreement with one another, being in harmony with one another. That's God's desire for the church. That's the thing that Jesus wants to see. That's why he comes amongst us. And it's when we agree that God will actually listen to our prayers and our hopes for the future and our desires to be working with him in bringing about that future. Togetherness, fellowship, agreements, these are vital things for Christian disciples. And the strange thing is that even in this time of pandemic, where we are separated and supposed to keep our distance from each other, and we are not meeting regularly as we used to on a Sunday, even now, we can still gather together. It can still be done through the wonders of technology. The telephone is a marvellous instrument and one we're all used to. But these days, it's not just the phone. There's Skype and FaceTime and Zoom and ways of uh, talking face to face with people live, not just in a recording as I'm doing now, a live conversation uh, where we see each other, we can hear each other. And all right, it's not being in the same room, but it's as close as we can get. And it still gives us that opportunity for gathering together, for being in fellowship, for being in harmony. Because in the end, it isn't that physical space that matters. It's being held together in Christ that matters. And maybe that's really what he's trying to say here. Come together, agree with one another, and then wonderful things can happen. I think Charles Wesley puts it a lot better than I can in the hymn. All praise to our redeeming Lord who joins us by his grace and bids us each to each restored. Together seek his face. Together. Amen. And let's sing that hymn of Charles Wesley's.
Let us pray. Lord, we have heard what you said in your written word, and now we want to talk with you about our hopes and fears for the church and for the world today. We think of the church as your people, Christ's body, at least a foretaste of your new creation. Some part of your purpose, Lord, must have been realised in it. And sometimes the lives of Christian people do put the world to shame. But the church does not proclaim the gospel so clearly that people are left without excuse. We cannot be surprised when they do not find Christ easily through the church. How can this be put right, Lord? How can your life be released in the church and transform its worship and its service? We believe in your purpose for the church. Help us not to be imprisoned in unbelief. Few of us, Lord, are people of great influence or responsibility. And we wonder how our prayers can affect the course of the world's life. We cannot believe that war or tyranny or famine or sickness are the conditions under which you intend people to live. And yet many have prayed for peace, but war has not been averted. The tyrant falls only after he has caused much misery. Famine is still normal for most people. Sickness still takes its toll. We believe that these are evils to be fought, and yet that the human race itself is not equipped to fight them. We need the love only you can give, love which is prepared for great sacrifice, creative thought, untiring patience. Meanwhile, we ask you to give us strength and give strength to those who suffer from these evils. Make us alert to ways of making things easier for them. Lord, you so often astonish us by granting requests which were only half formed, by enriching our experience in unexpected ways, by reminding us of factors we had overlooked. However, you answer these prayers. May the outcome be that we love you more, understand your purpose better, and believe in you with greater confidence. In the name of Christ. Amen. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest upon you all wherever you are, whenever you are watching this now and evermore. Amen.